So our next speaker is Julia Fanti. She's an assistant, assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, and she'll be sharing her thoughts on the deconstruction of blockchain to approach physical limits. So let's hear it for Julia. Um, OK, hi, everyone. So today I'm going to be talking to you about scaling blockchains to their physical limits. And this was joint work with a number of collaborators, Vivek Bagaria, Sriram Kanan, David Shea, Shea excuse me, and Pramod Vishwanath. OK, so the theme of this conference is the next 10 years, right? And one of the big challenges, at least from a technical standpoint, is scalability. Okay, so in response to the scalability challenges that blockchains face, there's been a number of consensus protocols that have been coming out, okay, kind of a zoo of consensus protocols. And a very, and here I want to put a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not ordering different consensus protocols on this slide. This was mainly just to show that there's a lot of them. There's a lot more that I haven't shown here. And it's difficult to compare consensus protocols just in terms of throughput and latency because they all have different security guarantees. So we saw a nice talk earlier on, um, by Elaine on some of the security guarantees that you should be thinking about. Yes. Regardless, there's a lot of protocols. And a natural question to ask is when do we stop? Okay, how do we know when we've reached the best possible consensus protocol? Okay. And of course, this is a difficult question to answer, but at least in terms of scalability, two properties that we really care about are throughput and latency. And a very natural lower bound on latency is the speed of light propagation delay. So how long does it take a transaction or a block to reach the rest of the nodes in, in your system? Another natural upper bound on throughput is the capacity of your network. Okay, so how many bits per second is your network physically able to transmit? And just to give you a sense here, um, so in most developed countries, uh, the average internet network speed is between like 10 and 20 Mbps. Okay, so this, if we assume a transaction size of like 500 bytes per transaction, this is giving us a throughput of about 5,000 transactions per second. Okay? So if you're seeing um, projects that are claiming numbers that are way higher than this, um, typically they're either assuming some additional uh, tricks like uh, se second layer solutions or sharding, or they're making assumptions that their network is running on a, a stronger network than the average internet connection. Okay? And um, as a benchmark, the average propagation delay, there were some nice measurements done recently in a paper called OHI, uh, where they show that the average propagation delay is around 1.5 seconds. If you strip a block of all the transactions of all the stuff inside. Okay? So these are some um, kind of guidelines for what we can expect from a consensus protocol. So in this work, um, we decided to ask, how close can we get to these benchmarks? And in particular, we started by first deconstructing existing protocols, so understanding what are the components and how do they relate to each other, and then uh, rebuilding them together to propose a new protocol that achieves provably close to the optimal throughput and latency. Okay. So let's start by deconstructing Bitcoin. So I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with this. So in Bitcoin, we know that when a user generates a transaction, that transaction first gets included in a block. But this transaction has not been added to the ledger yet. It only gets confirmed when there are k other blocks beneath it on the longest chain in the blockchain. Okay? And so here when I say confirmation, uh, I mean that the transaction cannot be reverted with a probability more than some epsilon, which is chosen by the user. Okay? So this number k, the number of blocks that I have to wait for, also depends on what epsilon, what reliability I, I want. Okay? And in fact, in, in Nakamoto's initial paper, he had a table showing how this parameter k corresponds to the parameter, to the reliability epsilon. Okay? And if we account for Bitcoin's uh, mining rate, which is one block every 10 minutes, we can translate this rule into a latency curve. Okay, so here we see as the reliability epsilon decays, notice this is on a log scale, uh, we can see how the latency increases. Okay? And in particular, I want to point out that the slope of this curve is proportional to 1 over f, where f is our mining rate. So a, a very natural thing to do when you see this is to say, OK, well, if the slope is proportional to 1 over f, why don't I increase f, my mining rate? 
And in fact, if you do that, you get a curve with a more shallow slope. Okay, so for the same reliability, you have less latency. Okay, so this seems like a good idea. And in fact, if we look at the throughput as well, the throughput scales as f. Okay? So since we want high throughput and low latency, it seems like increasing f is a really good idea. Let's make more blocks per second. So why don't we do that? The answer turns out to be forking. Okay? So if we increase f too much, we can increase it a little, but if we increase it too much, we're going to get a bunch of blocks being produced at the same time. Okay? And now the adversary, who's building a private side chain, can um, build a chain of, uh, of a lot more blocks and overtake the honest main chain more easily. Okay? So intuitively, increasing the mining rate is trading off efficiency for security. And in fact, we can see the curve that shows the security level as a function of F, our mining rate. And here by security, I mean what fraction of malicious nodes can we tolerate in the system. Okay. And just as an example, Bitcoin operates at a kind of conservative uh, operating point that's robust against 49% uh, malicious uh, nodes in the system. Okay, so our first order solution, our first attempt, which was to increase the mining rate, doesn't work. Another natural solution that people talk about a lot in this space is increasing the block size. Okay? So increasing the block size uh, does increase our throughput, because now we're adding more transactions per unit time. But notice that bigger blocks actually take longer to propagate. Okay? So this means that our latency actually gets worse. And similarly, for the same reason, our security also gets worse. So at least in this respect, increasing the block size is uh, an inferior solution to increasing the mining rate, okay? at least within certain bounds. Okay? So our two kind of straw man solutions don't work. So let's try to think about what we can do instead to actually meet these, to actually meet these fundamental limits on performance. So the first thing that we did in PRISM was to try to understand what are the different roles that blocks play in a blockchain. Okay? And in Bitcoin, we've seen that a block really plays two roles. The first one is that it adds transactions to the blockchain. Okay? So we saw that initially when a user generates a transaction, a block is needed to actually introduce that transaction into the ledger. And the second role is that blocks vote on prior blocks. So anytime I append a block to the longest chain in the system, I'm implicitly saying, I believe every prior block in this chain is valid. Okay? So it's, like, it's as if I'm voting and saying that this is the one true chain according to me. Okay? And intuitively, role one is controlling the throughput of my system. So the more transactions I can add per unit time, the higher my throughput will be. Whereas the second functionality is really controlling my latency. Okay, so the faster I can confirm a block, the lower my latency will be. Okay? And what we saw with these straw man solutions earlier was that it's difficult to scale up these functionalities together while still preserving security. Okay? So the key idea of PRISM is to separate these two roles. Okay, so we have one piece of a pipeline that translates transactions into blocks. Okay? And we have a separate piece that translates blocks into a ledger and does the confirmation. Okay, and, we can, and because we decouple these, we can scale each of them up while still preserving security. And I'll show you how that's done. Okay, so to explain PRISM, uh, it has a few moving parts, so I'm going to start by explaining a slightly simpler version of it. So in PRISM, we have different types of blocks now. So previously in Bitcoin, there was only one type of block. Now we're going to have, we'll start with two types. One are transaction blocks, which are being generated very quickly. Okay? And in parallel, we have a proposer tree. Okay? And this looks pretty similar to how the Bitcoin blockchain looks. Okay? And what the proposer tree is going to do, its role is to point to transaction blocks. Okay? So when a, when a proposer block points to a transaction block, it's saying, I believe these transactions are part of the ledger. And for now, let's suppose that this proposer tree is growing according to the longest chain rule. So it looks very similar to Bitcoin's blockchain. Okay, so 
Um, so in parallel, transaction blocks are being made, and proposer blocks are also being made that pull transactions into the blockchain. Okay? So this happens. All right. Now, if we think about this system, this actually has higher throughput than uh, regular Bitcoin protocol because it's pulling in transactions at a faster rate. Okay? So it addresses part one of, of the roles of blocks. But if we think about the latency, in order to actually confirm a transaction, I need to wait for k blocks to appear on the proposer tree. Okay, so I have exactly the same latency as Bitcoin. Okay, so we said that was not good, so th this is not a sufficient solution. Okay, so what I'm gonna do instead is to get rid of this longest chain rule. So I'm gonna get rid of those arrows. And instead of using longest chain confirmation on my proposer tree, I'm going to replace it with a different confirmation pipeline. Okay. This pipeline consists of a number of parallel, what we call voter trees. Okay. So these are, you can think of there as being like a thousand of these. So there's a thousand parallel blockchains that are playing the role of confirmation. And what these voter trees are going to do is the following. For each level in my proposer tree, they're going to vote on which block they think is the one true block. Okay, so at level one, there's only one block, so they all vote for the one guy. At level two, we see that there's two proposer blocks. Okay, so, so the voter trees now have to choose. So like these first two chose the block on the right, whereas the third tree chooses the block on the left. Okay. Um, so, and now we're going to confirm the proposer block that has the majority of the votes. Okay, so in this case, the block on the right got the most votes, so it goes into the ledger. Okay, then at the third level, there's only one block and so forth. And so one thing I wanna point out here is that each of these voter trees is using longest chain confirmation or can use longest chain confirmation and uh, is growing at the same rate as Bitcoin and Bitcoin's normal tree, okay? So each individual tree is growing slowly, but there's a lot of them. So in aggregate, they can confirm quickly, okay? So what we've done here is to move the security of our system away from this proposer tree, which is growing at Bitcoin rates, and moved it off to the voter trees. And I'll explain in a second why those voter trees are faster than regular Bitcoin. Okay. All right, so this is the architecture. Now, some of you in the audience uh, may be wondering, well, why can't an adversary just focus all of their attention on, say, one of the voter trees to try to break security? Okay. And to do this, we use a technique similar to uh, what's done in Bitcoin to mine blocks. Okay. So in Bitcoin, to mine a block, we're going to hash some contents. We're gonna hash the parent block, a nonce, some contents, and we're going to take the output of that hash, and let's say the output gets mapped to somewhere in the output space. Okay, so this white rectangle represents the output space of my hash function, and the arrow represents where in the output space I get mapped. And in Bitcoin, we say that if your hash is below some threshold, then you get to propose a block, right? So in PRISM, we do something comparable, except now we're going to expand this hash function. Okay, so we're gonna choose one parent for the transaction blocks, one parent for the proposer trees, one parent for each of the voter trees, so there could be up to a thousand of these, or even more, I'm just using a thousand as kind of a benchmark. And now we're going to split our output space into many regions. So one region that corresponds to proposer blocks, one region that corresponds to each of the voter trees, and one region that corresponds to transaction blocks. Okay. And the key thing to notice here is that we are now the, the range of values that map to any kind of block is much larger than in Bitcoin. Okay, so your likelihood of mapping some block is higher than it would have been in Bitcoin, um, but your probability of getting a proposer block or a block in a given voter tree is about the same, okay? All right, so 
Now, let, let me talk a little bit more about why this has good latency. So I said earlier that the role of these voter trees is really to confirm transactions or blocks. Okay, so let's suppose that here at level two, we have two blocks, A and B, and we want to understand now which one of these two blocks is going to, be, is going to end up in the final ledger. So each of these voter trees is gonna place their vote. Okay, so here again, we're gonna assume two of the voter trees vote for B, and the third one votes for A. Now, in principle, we would like to say that B is in the ledger, but we can't really say that yet because these voter trees, the longest chain might change in the future. It hasn't stabilized yet. Each of the voter trees has not stabilized yet. So what we could do is to wait for each of these uh, voter trees to become, uh, or voter tree blocks to become K deep. Okay, so here we use the Bitcoin confirmation rule on each of the individual voter trees. And once that happens, we're guaranteed that with high probability, those blocks will not get displaced, and therefore their votes will be permanent. Okay? So that means that we can say with high probability that B is confirmed to be in the ledger. Okay. Um, the problem with this is that it's slow. So remember I said each individual voter tree is growing at the same rate at, as Bitcoin's current system. So it turns out that what we can do here, and one of the key insights of PRISM, is that we can confirm each of these voter trees with lower probability. Okay, so let's suppose instead of waiting for six blocks, we wait for two. Okay? Now, each of these votes is less certain. Okay, so it has some probability of getting reverted. But because we have a bunch of these voter trees, we, uh, by the law of large numbers, we know that in aggregate, their vote is going to remain permanent. Okay? So we've given ourselves less certainty in each individual tree, but we're, gaining, but we're keeping the high probability guarantees by spreading it over many voter trees. Okay? All right. So Let's go back to our latency plot. So we saw that, remember we saw that Bitcoin, as our reliability uh, improves, our latency also improves pretty steeply. Okay? And now, by adding a bunch of these voter chains, we're actually making much better use of the capacity of the network. And we're able to decrease the slope of this line from something that's scaling as order one for Bitcoin to order one over C for PRISM, where C is the capacity of our network. Okay, so this is an improvement of several orders of magnitude for most networks, for most of the kinds of networks that we would see in practice. And in fact, this allows us to bump up against the fundamental lower bound that I talked about at the very beginning of this talk. So remember we said that no blockchain can do better than the speed of light propagation delay, which we're calling D. Okay? And so what we see here is that the latency achieved by both Bitcoin and Prism is lower bounded by D. So actually we should cut off that, the slope of that line. And the key point here is that Prism is able to maintain a latency that looks close, that is close to D, even for very high reliabilities. Okay. And in fact, the elbow of this curve is a parameter called the um, bandwidth delay product. Okay, so this is a very common notion in the networking literature. And because our capacity is high, the capacities of modern networks are quite high, this bandwidth delay product is also going to be large. Okay? And that means that we can achieve very good reliability while exhibiting latencies that are on the order of the network delay. So um, the main result of our paper is that if the adversarial power is less than one half, um, PRISM is guaranteed to confirm transactions with a delay proportional to D and a reliability exponentially small in the bandwidth delay product, CD, which we said uh, was a large number, and also achieve optimal throughput of one minus beta times C. Okay, so one minus beta is the fraction of honest computational power in our system, and C is the capacity of our network. 
So, I mean, so far I've been, these results are theoretical. It might not mean too much to you. Um, so we did simulate these, uh, these protocols and we're in the process of building a, a more complete implementation. But just to give you some ideas of what kinds of numbers you could expect. Um, so here we are simulating uh, both PRISM and a longest chain protocol where we're making one block every 10 seconds. And um, our reliability here is e to the minus 20. Okay, so that's a very, very strong reliability. Um, that's much more than the six block rule. Okay? And um, so here we see that PRISM under these conditions is giving us confirmation within a minute. Um, and I wanna stress that if you used a weaker confirmation rule, you could get these numbers down substantially. So um, with that, I'll leave you with some takeaway messages. So the first one is that when we think about the efficiency of a network, of a blockchain protocol, it's important to think about it in the context of the network on which it's running. Okay, so oftentimes people will um, give numbers like we can process this many transactions per second or we have this latency. And those numbers are kind of meaningless unless you know what kind of network they're being run on, what hardware, like what's the topology, all of these parameters. Um, and in fact, it turns out that a lot of existing consensus protocols are operating far away from these physical limits. And the second takeaway message is that PRISM operates provably close to these physical limits on latency and throughput. All right. Thank you all for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Could you go back to one of your earlier slides, which showed the fork in the in the chain, and, sure. the, uh, and the forking trees over on the right Is side, it, trying to pick this which one? one? No, no, it was it was. It was, um, was it um, in the description of Prism? Yeah, it was in. Is when you hit, yeah, okay, here we go. So, did you mean to show that block on the right as the one that ends up in the ledger? Because that's not how Bitcoin works. Exactly, so that, that's exactly the point, right? So if we were doing longest chain on the proposer tree, the block on the right would not be part of the ledger. Right. But in PRISM, it can be, because the confirmation does not come from appearing on the longest chain, it comes from what the voter trees decide. And in this particular case, most of the voter trees voted for the block on the right, Therefore, that's the one that ends up in the... But then all the subsequent blocks should emanate from the one on the right, not the one on the left, or you're going to have a wrong set of transactions. Okay, good. So I left out an important detail here, which is that when we're actually um, confirming blocks and adding them to the proposer tree, we're not doing transaction validation like you would do in Bitcoin. Okay? So... There's some issues around, uh, so, so some of that is done for consistency in the ledger. Other, another reason is for spam. But in this particular, and so there's some kind of low level tricks for getting around that in this case. But um, the point is that when we construct this ledger, we're not actually doing those checks as the ledger is being built. It happens later. So you can have, you can have transactions in your blockchain that are not consistent with each other, they get pruned out later. Yeah, it's, um, there's some subtleties here which are explained in great detail in our paper. This is available on archive. I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to chat after the... Uh, thank you, Professor. Very nice talk, thanks. So I have uh, one concern is, um, the block is mi when the block is mining, it doesn't know that which chain it's going to be, right? So that's right. Yeah. Then you have to include all the tip node into the block. Like, okay. Good question. So does that like cost like a lot of storage for the block? Good question. Um, so here I made a simplification just to make this a little bit clearer. We don't actually include all of this in the block. Um, what we do is to include the Merkle root and the proof for whichever block you end, or for whichever tree you end up appearing in. So it's logarithmic in the size of the number of But do you still trees. need some kind of consensus on these uh, Merkle trees, right? You need some, a lot of nodes to store, to storage this Merkle tree. The 
I mean, the, the Merkle tree ends up in the block itself. So it increases the overhead a little bit for each individual block. That, that is true. But the size of that is constant per block. OK. All right. Thanks. I think this might actually be our, our goal. If we can keep these questions, like, maybe, maybe if, the, if the three of you guys ask the question, and then you can answer all three. Yeah. OK. <laughs> we'll do that sometime. Uh, thank you for the talk. This is very exciting. Uh, does this protocol support light clients? Uh, w in principle, yes. We haven't thought about that yet, um, or we haven't thought very deeply about that yet. Um, but yeah, it would it would have to support like clients to be practical. While you've got this on the screen, could you explain that again? I didn't. I didn't. Um, oh, okay. I, I don't understand what what the uh, what the miner's target is supposed to be. Oh, okay. So previously, we said that like. The Bitcoin example was clear, right? what, what happens in Bitcoin. So now, instead of setting just one threshold, we're going to divide the output space into regions. Okay, so if your hash maps to the blue region, then you're generating a proposer block. If it maps to the first orange region, you're in the first voter tree. Does that help? Okay. So it seems like this, um, this protocol is similar to block dag based protocols like Phantom. Sorry. Oh, it oh, seems like, yeah. yeah, it seems like the, uh, this protocol is similar to block dag based protocols like Phantom. Yeah. Um, do you mind elaborating on how they differ? Sure. Um, so there's been a lot of protocols that use DAGs to try to take advantage of forking. So allow you to increase your mining rate while also including the forked blocks in your ledger. Um, so we follow that line of work very closely. Um, I think there's some interesting ideas there, but the proofs, the security proof, or the proofs that show latency, throughput, and security are not all there in, in the paper, or like are not complete, I guess. So I think that's still an open question if that can be made to work with provable guarantees. But it's, it's definitely an interesting question. <laughs> 